everyone see my screen? Yes, we do see your screen, and I see a couple of ketchup bottles. Is that? Are you going to talk about ketchup to the user group today? Because you're getting me a little worried, Matt. <laughs> well, let me uh, answer that question with a question, Reza. Reza, do you like French fries? Um, yeah, when I'm trying to basically uh, check my weight, but yeah, I do like French fries. <laughs> that's great. That's great. So have you ever ordered a plate of French fries and then you wanted ketchup on them? So you took the ketchup off the middle of the table and you turn it upside down and the ketchup just doesn't come out. You're like waiting there for half an hour and it just kind of sticks to the top and you just have no ketchup on your fries. It's happened a lot of times. Yeah, and it's a big problem, right? Huge problem. Well, I got a tip for you, Reza. What you can do is you can store your ketchup bottle upside down on the table or on the fridge so that all the ketchup falls into the nose of the ketchup bottle, right? Gravity kind of does its work. And then when you take the lid off the ketchup bottle, the ketchup just falls straight out onto your fries. How do you like that? I love that. I got to give that a try, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a shorter time uh, between getting ketchup on your fries and you eating them, right? So that's pretty that's awesome. A great, that's a great hack. Do you know what I call it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I call that a life hack. Mm. And a life hack is just something that's super simple and anybody can do it. And it makes some aspect of your life just that much more easy. Okay, so life hacks aren't something that are hard. Um, they're all about improving something that you do every day and everybody in the audience has a life hack whether they know it or not because we all do things in our own unique ways so to kick her off here i'd like to share with you a couple of my own personal life hacks that have nothing to do with power apps so life hack number one i'm a pretty busy guy and when i go to work in the morning i don't want to spend a time making lunch so do you see these soup jars right here these jars of soup mason jars each sunday I make a huge batch of soup, and then I put the soup in mason jars in my fridge. And that way, when I'm heading off to work in the morning, I can just grab a jar of soup from the fridge. I don't even have to spend any time making the soup, and I get all my veggies for the day. Life hack number one. Life hack number two. I'm attending a lot of user group sessions lately, and they're all across the globe. Um, I've attended one in London, in Houston, in Australia. And I'm always wondering, like, what time is this at? Because people are always posting the times in their own local time. So you can just go to Google and type in their time zone and say to my time zone, and it automatically does a conversion for you. What do you think of that, Reza? Hmm, I don't relate to the first one, but I do to the second, actually, because I run the Houston user group. So I, I post a link actually out to a URL that does time zone conversions for you. But I, I completely agree. That's a great hack because... Many a times we just post our, our meetings at 5 p.m., 6 p.m. We fail to we fail to understand that our audience <laughs> is global now and, and things are virtual. So that's yeah. a great hack again. My third life hack, I'm always losing things, especially my wallet and my keys. So I bought this little thing called an item finder and you stick it inside your wallet. And if you ever lose your wallet, you just pull open the app on your phone and it'll show you on a map where your wallet is and it's and the darn thing starts dinging. So you can walk right over to it. <laughs> and then the fourth life hack I have here, I'm also a little bit of a messy eater, a little bit of a messy eater. And I'm super embarrassed whenever I get something on my clothes and I'm at the office, right? Never want to walk into a client meeting looking like a slob. So I keep a little stain remover pen in my desk. And whenever I get a little coffee or a little ketchup stain, you know, from that ketchup bottle I showed you on the first slide, I just kind of take it off with a little stain remover. What do you think? What do you think of those hacks? I think I relate to both of these, especially the first one. I'm actually going to give you an example of my ear pods that I keep losing every now and then. But there is the Find My iPhone app that also enables you to play a sound on my ear pods when I lose them. So, yeah, I kind of relate to that one more. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, that's enough of my tips here. I'm not here to be everyone's personal life coach. Um, but, but what I am here to show you is some Power Apps tips and tricks. So today's presentation is called Power Life Hacks, Tips and Tricks to Make You More Productive. We're going to go to through two large examples here, showing you several tips and tricks along the way. And I'm going to kind of be driving the presentation and Rez is going to kind of act as my interviewer. But before I get into it, uh, a couple of you are probably wondering, 
who the heck is this guy? Well, my name is Matthew Devaney, and that's a picture of me right there, back in a time when haircuts were deemed necessary by society. Look a little bit different right now. <laughs> you can follow me at the Twitter handle like that right there. I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is in Canada. That's about 22 hours north of Houston if you're driving. Don't suggest making the trip right now, but someday, maybe. I don't do power, ha power apps too often in my job. Um, I'm an accountant by day and kind of a hobbyist coder by night. Lots of fun at parties, right? <laughs> and if I'm known for anything in the community, it's probably for spending every waking hour on the forum answering questions. So I think I got about a thousand solves right there. Actually, I checked my my stats before I came here today. It's 1100. So, but who's counting, right? <laughs> well, I do. He does about a hundred a day. So. Yeah. Uh, yes, I've been on the forum for 11 days. That's right, Reza. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm gonna switch over to my first app right here. Okay, so in the first example, we're gonna be building this app over here on the right, starting with this just very basic form here on the left. I like to give all of my examples themes. So in today's example, we're gonna be making apps for Ketchup Club. Ketchup Club. Ketchup Club is a ketchup subscription service, kind of like Wine of the Month Club, and they'll send four bottles of ketchup each month to your door for you to sample, right? For the ketchup connoisseur. Reza, do you consider yourself a ketchup connoisseur? Maybe. For today's meeting, I'll say yes. <laughs> okay, yes, yes. We'll suspend disbelief, yes. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So with that being said, it's uh, time to get started making this app over so here. Hmm, Matthew, I'm looking at your screen what you're sharing right now. I see like you want to you you're gonna try and meet the you're gonna try and make that form on the right on the left hand side. That's right. We're gonna try and make it right hmm. over here, matching what it looks like on the right. Okay. First thing I observe is the right one has is like a single column layout, but the left one looks pretty weird. It has like three columns and it looks like it's just not fitting in that space. Is that something <laughs> that that can be done quickly? Yeah, it can. So when I put the form on the page, this is what it looked like. Power Apps has a great sense of style, but we want to look like the form on the right over here, and we don't want to spend the time taking each individual field and laying it out in you know one or two columns. So what you can do is click anywhere on the form, and then over on the right-hand side, you'll see this columns dialog. Oh, that's kind of interesting. I could choose two columns, or I could choose one column, and now it's kind of looking like our form on the right. But wait, we're not done yet. We also want to change the layout because we don't want to have our titles over top of the text box. We want to have them to the side. So we click horizontal, and that's going to make our form a little bit more compact. Makes sense. That was pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of a hack there. Hmm. But what about what about the colors? How how do you normally change the colors? Because uh, you have a form control and I believe every card is different. And how do you go about setting up the coloring scheme for your form? So Reza, I like to set up a theme before I get started in my app. And I've seen several great ways of doing this. Uh, Sancho had a great way. Uh, April has a great way. And I'm just going to kind of show you my way, okay? So what I like to do is I like to set up my colors as a variable inside the apps on start property. So I click on app right here and you can see I'm on on start. And what I've done is I've set a variable inside these little squiggly brackets with about four different colors. Okay, mm -hmm. so primary one, that's a nice red. Primary two is black. You know, we got a lighter red and kind of a darker gray. All the colors that I'm gonna be needing to build my form on the right. What I'd like to show you that's so handy about this is actually, I'm going to delete this right here. Let's say we want to change the color of this little icon for the date picker. So I'm going to go to icon background. I think everybody wants to change that color of that date picker. Everyone. Oh my gosh. Yeah, including yours truly, right? So I'm going to type in my variable name called uh, Ver Colors. And hey, look at it right there. These are all my colors that I could pick from. That's great. It's almost kind of like I have a color palette in front of me. 
Awesome. So I want to change it to red. So, so Matt, is that the intelligence that's baked into Power Apps that now showcases the data underlying the variables and collections? Yes, there is. So if you click on any variable that's a table and you highlight it and you kind of snap it out like I just did, you can see all the information stored inside that table without having to go to the special collections viewer. So I'm just going to choose a uh, primary one. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And I'm going to do the exact same thing for my auto renewal here. And that'll be true fill. Of course, the very nice thing about having your colors stored in variables is if you ever change your mind, it's very easy to change the entire theme of your form. Matthew. Yes. Uh, I like the way how you change the color of the date picker, but when you click on the color picker, date picker, it shows the dates. It will apply on that as well, or it will be still blue, the static color. Um, it will take the color from the variable. So if I were to go and change it right no, here, no. I mean to say that I mean to say when you when you play the uh, app, when you play the app, uh -huh. and uh, try to select the date, it will pull down the menu to select a date, right? Yeah. When you click on that, yeah. This one I'm talking about. Is there a way to change the color over here as well? Um, there's some special ways to do that. Uh, you can do that with, uh, I believe, Sancho's um, Power Apps branding template, and you can also do it by changing the theme up here. But there's actually no property that will allow you to change the date picker and color once you've clicked it. And in that mind, that's kind of a big oversight. Yeah, that's what yeah. I did. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Matt, do you follow any naming standards by any chance? Because I see you're creating variables, you're creating, I'm assuming you're not just creating one variable, you're probably going ahead in your in your app and building multiple variables. Is there any peculiar naming standard that you would recommend to the audience? Uh, there is. So I've called mine var colors because there's two types of variables in Power Apps. One is called a global variable, and you can access it from any screen in your app. And there's also a second type of variable called a local variable, which you create using the update context function. So any variable with that, we start, we make it start with LOC. And then that way we know when we're searching for the variable that we want to use, we know whether it's scoped to the screen or scoped to the entire app, right? Can we use it just inside this particular screen or use it from, from anywhere? And we can also just see our variables very quickly if we type in VAR or LOC. Hmm. Okay. So Matt, I see you've changed the background color for the auto renewal column and the sign up date calendar, yeah. but is that not a tedious task, especially in a form control? Because I believe you have to go through and change them one by one because those are those data cards that come with the form control. Is that is there is there a hack here where I can just change things in one go or something? Oh yeah, yeah, there definitely is. Like, oh my gosh, it is so awful to try and do each one of these separately. You'll notice I'm trying to click on each individual cart, like a uh, input field here, but Power Apps just won't let me. It's just like, what the heck is going on, Power Apps? Why won't you let me do that thing I want to do? So here is like a super mega awesome hack that you can use to select all the inputs and and, and titles at once. So you click anywhere on the form. You go over to the side and you hit the layout button. You switch it from horizontal to vertical. You just toggle it, okay? So it screws up my layout. But then I go up to the top here and I click undo. Don't hit control Z. It only works with the undo button. And now look over to the right. What's happened? Uh -huh. It's selected all my titles and inputs. Holy cow, that's amazing. So now I can go about starting to, to change all these things. Okay, so... I'm going to start by changing the size, and I had created a, a variable called style settings that hold, held the size. So you can see that changes right there. I'm going to change wow. my font, style settings font. That's perfect. I'm going to change my color to black, and after that, it's going to get a little bit tricky because now I need to target 
just the titles individually. As you see on the right hand side, they're bold. OK, so mm. I need to actually deselect all of the inputs by typing in value. And I need to hold my control key and start deselecting them like that. And now mm. I will change the font weight to bold or semi bold rather. That is amazing, Matt. So I can just just change the layout of my form control and just hit that and undo button on the top. Do I have to click that undo button? There's no other way. You have to click that undo button. Unfortunately, there's no other way. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Okay. <laughs> I hope somebody very influential is listening. <laughs> now I will just change the inputs very quick and I want to just uh, change the border thickness. Uh, maybe there's somebody very influential in the audience. If uh, if um, Reza is laughing like that, I don't know. I honestly haven't looked. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I was just asking you that question. So the magic is yeah. in that undo yeah. button, then, and you have to click on that, and it has to be on that top right. Yeah. No, no shortcuts. No. Okay. <laughs> Satya, are you there? Are you there? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Perfect. Look, look how fast we styled that form. Amazing. Is there, is there, now I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, this is, this is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Reza? What should we change next here? Oh, I think we, were we on mute there for okay. a second? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So my, my follow-up question to this would be, that's great. So I can I can select cards, I can make changes, that's that's great. But I notice on the right hand side there's a lot of spacing between your your cards, right? Like if you notice the spacing between the customer name data card and the street address data card. Yeah. I see a lot of space in there. How do you how do you do that on in your form? And I'm assuming with one click. So you're right, this form is looking a little bit cramped. I think we want to space it out a little bit. So can we select all of these cards to make a change at once? Well, I'm going to hold my control key to try and select two cards at once, but Power Apps doesn't look like it's going to let us. But don't break the faith, keep on holding that control key. And the third time I click it, oh, it starts selecting things. So that's a little bit of a bug in Power Apps, I think. So hmm. now I can select all these cards and I'm going to change the height to 70. And now we've got a little bit more space in our form. But you know what another thing I think we should change here is, Reza? I what? think we should change these stars to make them match the right-hand side too, right? Yes, agreed. And, I don't like that black star. And you'll recall that when I used my crazy hack there to select everything, it didn't actually select the stars, right? So how are we going to take care of that? Well, here's right. what you do to do this really quick. So first of all, I'm just going to give it some good old fashioned custom Matt Devaney style right there. So I'll go to color and I'll change it to Ver colors. I love that. I love how it always shows up. So I always know which color I'm going to be picking today. Okay. And I'll delete this one and I'll just copy it in its place. What? Oh no. Come on. <laughs> it looks like the control doesn't want to stick in the same spot. So I'm going to show you a little hack that Sancho Harker taught me to copy things in the same position. What you do is you go down to your X property of the variable and you multiply it by one and that's going to lock the left right position in place just because we multiplied it. Same thing with the Y position here. Anytime I multiply it by one, it's going to remain in the same spot when I copy it. And there you go. There you go. Now it stays in the same spot. I just had to trick Power Apps a little. <laughs> hmm. So you have to know a little bit of maths as well here to do that. If you can do times one of something, you can do the trick. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was cool. Yeah. OK. Uh You've made a lot of updates, man. The the form on the left now almost well, it does look like the form on the right completely. But yeah, are these are these changes being saved? Or what if like right now I'm having a poor internet connection? What happens if your your browser crashes or let's say Power Apps just does not save? 
oh my gosh, Reza, you're right. I can't believe I forgot to save. So Power Apps will normally do an auto save for you, but it will only start auto saving after you save something for the first time. Okay, so I'm going to go over to my file button over here and I'm going to check under account. And thank goodness, in this case, autosave was on. But if I hadn't saved this app before, if I hadn't prepared for this presentation, which would be kind of ludicrous, the autosave wouldn't be on here. So just make sure that you save, you know, exactly once to make sure autosave starts saving. So just when you open up your apps, first thing you do, just save them. Sad to say it's a little bit of hack, but yeah, it's a little bit of a life hack not to lose your apps. <laughs> <laughs> great great that's we gotta make sure that we save our app at least once <laughs> yes sir um i'm looking at your form so i'm assuming you, because you're using the form control you will you will go ahead and, and create multiple screens because you need a new form an edit form a view form do you do things like that because i've oh. seen a lot of folks on the forum who do that Oh my gosh, no, Reza, that would be a lot of work. <laughs> and you're right, I do see that on the forums all the time too. So here's a little bit of a hack for those of you who are building three forms where we can just do the work of one. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create some little buttons over to here to change our forms mode. And there's going to be three modes. One of them is going to be edit mode, so where we edit an entry. There's going to be a view mode where we can see the contents of the form but not do anything to it. And thirdly, there's going to be a new form mode where we can create a whole new record starting from blank. Okay, and we're gonna do this just with one form here on the right without switching screens. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by adding a few icons here. And at, oh, at, as always, we're going to add a little bit of style. There you go. So I've got one icon there. Could be a little bit bigger. Got icon number two right here. And this is going to be a very nice pencil looking icon. And number three is I'm going to. Noticing you're creating these icons very, very quickly. I'm assuming you're using copy paste. Uh, yes, yes, sorry. I'm using copy paste. And because I've prepared for the presentation, I am simply um, just changing the icon property. You can type icon and a dot, and then you can see all the options for icons that would <laughs> appear above. <laughs> there we go. I, I, I memorize a few here because I use them so often. OK, so let's make this uh, form appear in three different ways. So we want to target this on select property of our icons. And so for the first one, we want to type in new form and then the name of our form inside the brackets. And when we click this button, it's going to change the form into new mode. Click the button. Oh, everything disappeared. There we go, right? A whole new form. Next up, we're going to type in edit form in our on select property of this icon. And when I click it, it's going to bring that record back up, right? Now we're editing something. And finally, we're going to type in view form. I bet nobody guessed that after the last two. <laughs> and now we will just be able to view that information. So there you go. Three forms in one. Isn't that what life hacks are all about, Reza? Saving you time. Do I still got you there, Reza? Did we mute a microphone? <laughs> so, Matt. Yes, sir. Uh, Krishna again. So, for this form, what is the item value we provided? Is it like a filter with the first value, first of filter of the list item, or how did we provide it? Um, in this case, it was just the first of the list I provided. And I'm actually going to show you that uh, just upcoming, uh, oh. what I've done yet. Okay. Do I still got you there, Reza? Reza, we couldn't hear you. Yes, you do. You do have me here, and I'm I'm just uh, I was just looking at how you leverage the same form control multiple times. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're just amazed, right, by the 
the hack. <laughs> so, great, but how do I submit that form? What about the submit button? I don't see a submit button. Okay. So to submit this form, right, very important part of every form, I'm going to have to make my submit button. So I click the, the button control up top, and as usual, we're giving it a very nice style. And, oh, yeah, I make this mistake all the time. I always mix up uh, color and fill. So color is the text property and fill is the background. Okay, it must be red, perfect. Then I go to the on select property and I go to write submit form. I'm sorry, I can hear someone's uh, pen click in there, just so you know. <laughs> and I hit like that, submit form in the on select property. So when I go and click right here, it's going to submit the form. There's uh, one other thing I want to show you that I think is a pretty new feature before I go ahead and submit. Has anybody here heard of the spell checker feature before? I think this is going to be kind of a life hack for you know the people who actually use these things. So let's say I go to type in the word um, bananas, or let's do ketchup. Ketchup is awesome. Awesome is kind of misspelled, right? Right. Powerhouse has a new feature where I can click on the text input and I can click on enable spell check off to the right right here. Okay, so I think when the app is in play mode, oh, I, I, I misspelled awesome. That's huh. not very awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now it's awesome. <laughs> kind of handy when you want to to make sure you got your words 100% correct there. One other thing I want to show you is how we can hide this submit button in view mode, okay? So when we change our form around here by clicking on the magnifying glass, right? It doesn't really make sense that there's a submit button here because they can't submit the form. So we should try and hide that, right? So to hide something or make it show, we use the button's visible property. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if the forms display mode is equal to display mode dot view, right? We have edit view and new, then show the button, otherwise don't. Now, nice. I think I got this a little bit backwards here. I have to say does not equal. Okay. View. And then now our button's kind of hidden. But do you think we can improve that code a little bit, Reza? Um. Yeah, I think so. Do we really need the true and false? No, no, we don't actually. Because you see this statement right here? When I hover over it with my mouse, we can already see that it evaluates to false. So we don't need if to supply the true or false. We can make this much shorter by deleting the code on either end, right? Can you imagine how much time that's going to save you over the course of an entire app if you start writing things that way? Amazing. Well, that's and a good hack too. There you go. Right, when I click the edit button, the button appears again. Back and forth. Nice. Um. You know, one thing I'm thinking about the form control, which I've seen a lot, is let's say I fill a form out and then mistakenly I hit the back button. In that scenario, I've noticed I lose all the data that I entered in my form control. Is that is that something we can avoid somehow? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, we totally can. And people are going to love us for it. So just as an example, I typed in a customer name named Matt's Deli. And let's say that I become a little absent-minded and I click on the edit button. Well, I've just lost all my information there, right? And if I were all the way through the form, I'd have to go type it in again. What some people don't know, and I didn't know for the longest time, is there's this forms property called unsaved. And it can detect whether a form has been saved or not, right? Whether or not you've changed something in the form. So I'm just going to put a label up here to show you how it works. So if I type in form one dot unsaved uh, right now it's going to show as false right because we've got a new form right here but then if I start typing something again like Matt's deli it turns to true huh okay well how can we use that 
I think in most apps that you build, you're going to want to build something like a pop-up to say something like, you know, do you really want to leave this form? And in in just our example right here, building a pop-up would take far too much time. So I think what we're going to do instead is we're just going to disable you from being able to click the edit button by changing its visible property to not equals form unsaved, right? So if the form isn't saved, then you can't access those buttons. Nice. So now if I go and fill it in, ooh, do I really want to give away personal details? I don't know. Hopefully there's no credit card information in there. <laughs> <laughs> There might have yeah. to be a part of the video that mysteriously goes missing. <laughs> I know Houston has a street named Fake, but I don't know if there's a fake street. <laughs> or there's a one, two, three fake street, but yeah. I love that. <laughs> and then we just click a button right here. And now all of my options have come back. Hmm. But what do you what do you notice here, Reza, about what just appeared? Yeah, it looks like it's just it's not showing you the same data that you submitted. No. Yeah. no. But that's really how life should be, right? When you submit a form? No, no yeah. it should show you the last value that you submitted. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So how can we get that? Well, I'm going to show you one other uh, little known property called the last submit property of a form. And you can use it to grab all the data that you submitted from the last time you clicked this button, even if it doesn't appear on the screen anymore. So instead of form unsaved, I'm going to type form last submit. And using that handy IntelliSense, you can see, oh, there's all my data, right? It's all the data I said, but there's more here too. Oh my God, like there's the ID. So it's not actually just capturing the data that you submitted, it's also capturing the response from the database. Very nice. I'm actually thinking of a use case right now. I think this is another thing that folks do very frequently. When they submit mm -hmm. data to a system of record, they try to get the unique ID from that system of record and they query the system of record again. Yes. Now, looking at this, I probably don't have to do that because last submit already has that metadata available for me. Yeah, that's totally right. That's a great example of where you should be using this type of property. But but how can we use it inside our form here? So what I like to do is I like to assign the last submitted um, ID to the item's property. Uh, but before that, I like to do one more thing. So there's this property in a form called on success, and it only runs if something has successfully been input into the into the data source, like a SharePoint list or SQL database. So I store information about the last record in a variable and I just say store what was last submitted by form one and that way when I submit it it'll grab information about like which ID number was created then I go to my items property and I do a lookup on customers which is my data source. You can see all my customers right there. And ID is equal to variable last record dot ID. Okay, variable dot last record dot ID. And now when we go and fill this form in, oh, no item to display. Why could that be? <laughs> it's because we haven't actually submitted anything yet. So. I'll, I'll do this one more time. I'll say Matt's Deli 2, 234 Fake Street. The whole row of houses on Fake Street is going to get in order. <laughs> I'll type in the only zip code I know in America, 90210. And there you go, months remaining, and I'll click the Submit button. And now there you go. So now it comes up with the exact same data that I just submitted. I think we only have one more thing left to do, Reza. Do you know what it is? Yeah, the, the image. Cherry on top. Just copied. Nice. Boom. There you go. Yeah, I have one more question, actually. This is great. Some really great hacks. I noticed you kept going to the formula bar, right? Yeah, yeah. And it seems like you knew exactly which formulas you want to get. So you went and you picked 
the formula in that drop down on the top left which is great but many a times at least i do that mm. i go to the formula bar on the right or i look at the properties on the right first search for my property and then once i get the name of the property i go and look it up in the drop down like it's i keep going back and forth from the right hand properties pane to the top formula bar and i keep doing that because the right hand properties pane does not have enough space for me to plug the formula right so what i like to do reza is i click on the form item and i look over here to the right and you see where it says on success there's not a lot of space here to look at the code you can right. just click on the little on success right here and it brings up oh there you go right in your formula bar okay. pretty sweet eh? yeah so just by clicking on any property property name on the right hand side it just puts that into the formula bar on the top yep okay it can sometimes be less clicks than you know going in here and then clicking again and sometimes it's just one click kind of nice yeah for me it's more i don't remember the actual property names but i know for example success so i just keep searching for them yeah yeah wow so that's yeah. uh that concludes our first example there and I think that you know we were talking a lot back and forth between it, but if you can imagine me just going ahead and making this form here on the left, it probably would have only taken me like 10 minutes, right, to get my custom styles. Um, maybe we should just uh, take a quick moment to see if there are any questions from the audience on that first set of examples, Reza? Yep, let's check the chat window. So just to let you know, I was also heavily involved with you, so I have not looked at the chat window. Uh, <laughs> let's see what questions do we have. So. Fellow former accountant in the house. So you have another accountant in the house. Is there a way to change the default date picker, but it's complicated? I think Harder put out his amazing revamped date picker control that he posted in yes. the community. Yes, uh, please download yeah, that. Yeah, please, please double that. And he did he did demo this in the Houston user group as well. I don't think the date picker, but he demoed some really cool components last month. Um then we have any other questions? Oh, we have Keith Watling in the house. Hello, Keith. He says, can you do it again? Yeah, we've got this recorded, Keith. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he also says, Sancho, have I told you lately that I love you? So <laughs> mm, that is very important. Yeah, very magnificent human being. All right. We have okay. thing. order save is very important. Amazing hack. I'm just trying to find any questions right here. I do not see any questions. If I've missed any. Folks, feel free to go off mute. Okay, we got one. When we keep drop down control in the bottom of the form, and when it has many values, it does not show all the values. It just shows few values because of the real estate. Is there a hack for that? Hmm. What do you think on that one, Reza? Lots hmm. of drop down values. How many drop down values are we talking? Are we talking like 10 or 20? Like even more? Um, because when I'm thinking of a drop down, like as a user, I find it kind of confusing sometimes when there is like more than 10, right? You just, you have to keep on looking. So like sometimes I just like to use a combo box instead because it's kind of searchable and it will just retrieve what you want. But I, I understand that users don't always know stuff in advance. What do you think on this Reza? Yeah, I think I, I tend to agree with you. I think once you go beyond a particular number of items, in fact, I tend to just avoid drop downs altogether, even though I have three items in my, uh, even if I have, I'm sorry, even if I have three items to showcase, I tend to use the combo box because combo box has the option of turning off multi select. So it mm -hmm. acts like a drop down, anyways. I think it's a lot more powerful. And I think the second suggestion I could make is if you really have to have it on the screen, you might want to do them as radio buttons inside of a gallery, right? Or check boxes if they can select multiple in the drop down. Uh, because that way they're going to be able to see all the options at once, but you have the option to compact them maybe three or four across, like two or three down, right, in kind of a table. So those would be my design tips. I've also seen April do something really great with buttons. I think I saw that at, at, at Ignite instead of um, um, checkboxes and, and radio buttons. All right, I think that's about it. Okay, on to number two. Y'all ready for this? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is example number two. We're continuing continuing on with our catch-up club example, but we're making a different app. And this app is for our inspectors, okay? So here at the catch-up club, 
we quality is our number one value, right? We really care about the quality of the ketchup. So we have inspectors go down to the production line to check out and make sure the ketchup is coming off the line nicely. And what do they look for? Well, they look for four things. Is the color of the ketchup red? Is That's the right. Yeah, nothing's more <laughs> off-putting than orange ketchup. Um, <laughs> does the ketchup taste rich and tomatoey? Does the ketchup have a seductively smooth mouthfeel? <laughs> <laughs> I was reading up on ketchup and that's how it's supposed to taste, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Always got to be prepared for these presentations. And number four, ketchup smells like like fresh tomatoes. Delicious. Aren't you getting hungry already, Reza? Yeah, and it's almost dinner time here, so yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, those fries are waiting for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So this is going to be the focus of our second app. Uh, the inspector is going to complete the survey and then the email is going to get sent off to the foreman who's in charge of the line. But you know what, Reza? Like mm -hmm. this example already looks done. It already looks yeah. done. Yeah. That's not yeah, good, that's eh? Pretty neat though. Yeah, yeah. So how are we gonna, like, I, th I think I saved over this one and and I, sh I shouldn't have completed it before the presentation was done. Do you think there's yeah, something to do about that? Yeah, that's a great question actually. Many a times, uh... Well, in, in your case, it, it's it's for a good reason. Your app is completed. So you don't want to go back to an uncompleted app. But yeah, many a times you have a completed app and by mistake, you change a formula or something changes and things break. And guess yep. what? Autosave probably saves that. And maybe someone mistakenly even published the version. Is there, is there any trick here for me to go back to a previous version of my app just in case uh, something in my app doesn't function properly? Uh, this has happened to me so many times, and this this life hack is a real lifesaver. So, Power Apps is always auto saving in the background, and it keeps track of all your previous saves of your app. So, if I go out of this Power App for a minute, and I go into my list of apps I've created, and I click into the details section and go over to versions, here we can see all the different versions of my app, even like from the beginning of time, right? Mm back from the 14th when I created this. So if I want to restore my app back to when it was not finished yet, I can click on the three dots over here and then hit restore. I'm not gonna do that right, right now. We're gonna suspend disbelief a little bit because I don't want to anger the demo gods by doing a restore during a presentation. <laughs> not but uh, no, no, we've, we've already tempted them enough in this one. It's a live coding one. So yeah, I can go back to a previous version. That's great. Is there? Can I go back to a version that's a year older? Well, okay. So there's a little bit of a there's a little there's something you need to know about that, Reza. Mm -hmm. If you want to go back to an app that you've looked saved a year ago, you actually can't go back to it. Power Apps only retains the last six months worth of apps in this version's history. So mm -hmm. every every five or five and a half months or so, I think you should be going into all of your apps. And just mm -hmm. restoring them, or you know, creating some type of awesome flow if it's possible, or uh, or PowerShell or something like that. Hmm. You should you should need to have app publishing day. <laughs> and I'm assuming this being such an important aspect, I'm sure Microsoft has probably notified us somewhere. Is there a notification somewhere on this screen that tells me that? <laughs> oh, it's right in front of my face here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't read text that's above eight point font. <laughs> Or under eight point font. <laughs> totally missed that one. That's right. It's just st standing right out at me here. Yeah, it's yeah. very easy yeah. to read that. But yeah, it's there. Okay, that's good to know that it's there and it warns us that you cannot restore an app. So basically, I'm just thinking if I have an app that I haven't touched for over six months, it would be good if I just go and create the published version of that app. Please just do. to be sure that in case if I make a modification in future, I can at least go back to my previous version. Yep, B, B O C D only the paranoid survive. Right. I'll try and survive. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to go back to our app right here and we're going to suspend disbelief and say I click the restore button and we're back right here in my my unfinished app. Okay, I've got a lot of comments for you in this one already, but yeah, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why is the gallery again, placements are off. First thing that's throwing me off is the gallery. How do I how do I center align that gallery onto the screen? 
Well, here's a little hack for you, Reza. I'm going to show you how to get a little bit responsive. Have you ever heard of that word before? Have you heard the word responsive? Yeah, and I get scared when I hear that word. Oh, me too. But all responsive like really means is just, you know, shift the elements of your app like you know right in the center or position them really nice based on you know the app that you're using whether it's a big widescreen or a very small one okay so what i want to do is i want to put this gallery right here in the center that's pretty hard i have to like figure out you know where to put it on the x-axis that's not very nice right. what i'd like to show you is something called this app variable okay well, the app variable. So I just made a label to show you kind of what's inside of it. So this is an inbuilt function into Power Apps, and it gives you all sorts of awesome information about your app. For instance, I could type in active screen dot name, and there you go. Now I've got the actual name of this particular screen. I could also type in something like orientation, and now I can see that my screen is horizontal, which would be really weird since I'm on a desktop computer to be vertical, if you think about it. But uh, no, just horizontal. <laughs> but what we want to take advantage of here is we want to go to the width property, and that's going to help us make our gallery set right in the center, our gallery form right in the center. So this app is 1,366 pixels wide. Okay, so we'll just remember that number. So Easy here's what I easy to get yeah yeah so so here's what i like to do to center all my elements on the form and you don't even need to know any math just remember this simple method i go to the x axis and i type app dot width and then i type in form uh sorry this is a gallery <laughs> but it looks like a form so gallery form width i put this in brackets and i divide it by two and there we go. It's so like perfect. There, so now there is maths involved here because it's the app dot width minus whatever the control is in question. We are trying to center align the width of that control and the entire thing divided by two. Yeah. Hmm. That app variable is like super powerful. It has all sorts of applications that you can you can do with it. I think one more thing I want to do here though is I want to also um, offset it by the by the tomatoes picture. So I'm also going to type in image form one uh, tomatoes dot width. OK, and so now I've got it offset. Let's offset like that. Perfect. Perfect. So basically, you've positioned the controls relative to the other control and the width of the screen. You got it. You got it, and mister. That, and that's responsiveness. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work but it could be worse. <laughs> yeah, it could be worse. Could be worse. Well the, well, the thing that's worse right now and is sticking out for me like a sore th thumb right now is that uh, is the logo. Where oh. is our Ketchup Club logo out here? <laughs> it's gone. Ketchup Club doesn't have a logo at the moment. So <laughs> let's, let's get it back, okay? <laughs> so how can we do that? Well, we had a really nice Ketchup Club, Club logo in our other app. Can we take it out of there? Can we? I think we can, right? So we just check back over to our app number one, and we highlight what we want to take, and we hit our copy button, mm. and then we can paste it into app number two. Mm. Oh my gosh, like we didn't even need components there, Reza. That's yeah. crazy. You just copy controls from one app and just dump it in another one? Yeah, that, that blew my mind when I learned it. It took me like eight months into Power Apps to learn that. But... Uh, like, why would you be able to copy something over from one browser window to the other? <laughs> it's just insane. I don't know how they did that. <laughs> and I have a follow-up question. Can this, does this work in uh, across tenants as well? So let's say I have two, dif two different tenants. I'm assuming is this only a single tenant thing that you can copy and paste, or can I go cross tenants? No, you can go, you can crisscross your tenants, go any way you want, copy stuff over from one place to another. But there's one exception, and it's when you're copying these images because you actually need to load them first inside your media property. Mm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, right? Because they are a part of the app. They are packaged as part of the app. So yep. they need to, you need to ensure that they come through. And I'm looking at something new right here for media as well. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, we got this little handy media menu here. So before, to 
upload my media, I used to click file and go to the media section, right? And then find which images I wanted to put into my app. But that was kind of, you know, it was kind of long, right? Because yeah. I had to remember this name and then go and create the image. Oh my gosh. But now you can just kind of click and drag your images onto the page like that and not have to type them in. That's awesome. You know what I love about this right now? I'm looking at the What's preview that? of those images. I don't have to. Oh yeah. Like previously, at least in my scenario, when I when I uploaded images in my apps, I had names like one, two, three, four, and I was trying to search for what's one, what's two, what's three, what's four. Now, I can just look at it on the left and just drag and drop it on the right. Yeah, it's like it's like me. Everything I have is named tomato. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. Okay, let's let's keep going. So, I'm looking at your the header on top of the gallery. There's there's uh -huh. it says username here and it says time, and I'm assuming. Oh. You want to plug in the current username and the current time in there. I, I do, but you know, Reza, I think there's one more thing I wanted to do first. Okay. And I wanted to get this ketchup logo right in the center too. Okay, hmm. so okay. watch. Watch as I'm kind of clicking and dragging it. Do you notice all of those little lines that appear? Yeah. Yeah, It's what's it trying to do there, you think? They're trying to... Hmm. It's trying to snap it to the grid, right? It's trying to snap it to other yeah. objects. Yeah, actually, but, yes, that's what it's trying to do. But because I'm all fancy, you know, and because I like to have my way, I just want to place it exactly where I want it, right, without it being snapped. So I think this is a trick that Keith Watling um, taught me. So what do you do? You select all of your items in this logo, and you click and hold your left button on your mouse down, and then you hold the Alt key on your keyboard down, and now the snap to grid goes away. I can wow. place it wherever I want. All right, thank that. you. I really like that hack. That's a good one. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. But uh, you were saying about the, the username here. Yeah, I was curious about how you're going to get the username there. I'm assuming you want the current logged in user's name there and the current time in there. Yeah, yeah. So just like that inbuilt function called app, We've also got an inbuilt function called user in Power Apps. And how do I trigger it? Well, I just start typing user and then brackets and a little dot. And you can see I got a couple of options here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I go email, it'll take a moment. So I can bring up, you know, my personal email or my name or even a picture of myself. If we were using an image and everybody knows that's a picture of a cat, right? <laughs> Nice. But what if I need more properties here? I just see three. Is that is that all the user function exposes? That's all the user function exposes. But you know, there's a better way to do this. So here's the little hack that I like to use. You go over to your connectors and you start to use the Office 365 users connector. Okay, so this connector gets you information about people who are using the app. Now what do we do? Well, Instead of typing user full name, I start typing in Office 365, not Outlook, users. And I can use a function called my profile version two. Okay, very important. Use version two, not one. Okay, that's easy to remember. And when I type it like that, okay, it's not getting information yet, but you can see if uh -huh. I snap it out. There's, that, that is not my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, got to get you off this call right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't even been born yet, apparently, or something. I don't know. <laughs> can see the accounts enabled. Uh, I don't live in the US. So this is my personal tenant. I don't update it too much. But if we were inside our office tenants, right, presumably some of this information would be would be here. And you can you can even see the user type, whether they're a member of the organization or a guest. Wow. Which, which I think is super cool. That is cool. But uh, I think that one more thing I want to tell you to do is always make sure to put this in the on start property of your app. And why is that? Well, you noticed it was taking a moment to get the, the email there, right, Reza? And the username yeah. when I typed it, right? Because it's trying to yeah. download that information from, from where? Where is it trying to get that from? I know you know that one. All right, so we'll, we'll let the audience answer this one. Where, Where is, is it getting information yeah. from? Da, 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 da. I, the last comments I see from the audience is cool. Great hack. 
All right. That pulls the right. Use um, the final Azure. service. Azure, that's right. I think I heard Krishna there. Yes. Right. Azure. We will invent a prize to give to you at a later date. <laughs> it you may or may not have monetary value. Of our ketchup club, Krishna. There you go. President of the ketchup club. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> that's awesome. So now we can just put in the person's username by typing var user and I believe it's display name. Yep. There you go. That's me. So that's the person that's using the app right now, right? It's it's always good to know who's using the app. And Matt, another reason why you put it in the on start of the app is because, and you're storing it in a variable, is because if you think about it, the user's profile property is not something that's going to change during the session of an app. So it oh, right, makes yeah. it sense to store it initially and cache it locally so that we can leverage that same attribute or that same variable throughout my app rather than consistently calling Office 365 users dot my profile in various scenarios. It's that's a performance a of game. It's a lot of API calls. That is a lot. <laughs> okay, how do I get the time? The time, the time. How do we get the time? Okay, another inbuilt function here that you should just, just know there. It's kind of a life hack. So um, there's two date time functions that allow us to get information about the current date and time. The first one is today, but we can't use that because it only shows us the current date, right? So if I'm highlighting my label which doesn't seem to be respond oh i somehow created something over top of it it's invisible so um you can see it's just getting the date at 12 a.m right and that's not what we need so we want to actually get the time so there's a second function called now and it'll get you the date and the time but what do you think of that date time there reza it, it's not exactly in the format we want we just want the time right not the date yeah, we, just want to, we just need the time component you're right so there's this awesome function called text in Power Apps, and use it, you can use it to format numbers and dates into the format that you want to see it. So we type text, and then we type our value, which is now, and it comes up with a whole list of options right here. And if I just want to get the time in 24 hours, I can just click date time, short time 24, like that. And there you go. It's a 1908 where I am. Um, nice. If you... If you want to get a little bit fancy, um, you actually have the ability to put in custom date and time codes. Okay, there's more documentation for this on the Power Apps official uh, page, but you can see I can start typing in something that looks kind of like that and kind of get it customized if I want to too. But I think for now we'll just go with the time. So, so this is the audit form, right? And I'm assuming the auditors come in and and basically they need to fill this form out and submit this and. I'm assuming mm -hmm. the auditors are folks who need to be in the field and uh, they should not be filling this out from their desktop. Otherwise, they're kind of not following the the protocols. <laughs> may I say. So my question is, is there any way I can figure out if the logged in user is on a mobile device or if the logged in user is on an actual desktop? How do I? Is there a hack for that? Oh, yeah, definitely. We're going to kind of up our spy game with this one. And uh, once again, shout out to April in the audience. I think she's the one who showed me this through her videos. Uh, sorry if I'm shouting out too much, but I, I just can't you know help but pay it back to people who helped me. Um, so we got to device there. So how are we going to detect whether they're on a mobile device or on their computer? Well, we're going to write this fancy uh, if statement. So first, we are going to check the acceleration of the current user. So we type acceleration along, uh, we'll pick the X axis, okay? So that's the speed at which the phone is moving or someone is walking. And we know it's a mobile device if that is greater than zero, okay? So desktop doesn't move. It just stays in the same place. At least I it should. It <laughs> <laughs> but we do have to have a little bit of a fallback because sometimes laptops have accelerometers in them now right especially like the tablet laptops so we're going to put in a second condition here called location dot altitude and the altitude is going to have to be uh, greater than zero okay because the desktop will never emit its height how far it is above sea level <laughs> i hope it does not no no it really yeah, me too. So then we can type in here. You know, if it's true, it's a mobile. If it's not, it's a desktop. 
And there you go. I'm sitting here on my desktop computer. Very cool. Now, there's a real there's a real smart Alec on Twitter the other day who told me, well, you know, there's some town, you know, towns, you know, what, what if you were laying on the bottom of the you know ocean floor motionless then, you know, like w- wouldn't it emit the wrong result? And I'm like, if you if that's what's happening to you, buddy, like <laughs> but you probably have bigger problems in life and rather than your power app not working. <laughs> Shout out to Jonas. <laughs> okay, I got to go back to your Twitter handle and see who that individual was. Jonas Rap. <laughs> okay, Jonas Rap. Okay. <laughs> well, that was pretty cool. So I can figure out whether I'm on a desktop or whether I, I am on a mobile device by just using that plain simple hap- hack. And once again, I'm thinking I can just store that in a variable yep. in the OnStart yep. of the app and I can just use it throughout the user session. 100%. Oh, nice. Okay, many things are left unfulfilled here in this gallery. I see the question number. I see the question text. Are we going to fill those? Yes, we are. And did you notice how, like, in our previous app there, one was bolded? Oh, okay. So it was supposed to be bold. One was supposed to be bold and the other one wasn't. But what if we want to have, you know, our our question number be bold and um, this be normal text? Do you think we can do it one label, Reza? Do you think we can do it? I think we can. What, I think type, we can. What type of control do you think we should use there? Well, if you want to bold something, then that's that's basically HTML. So there must be an HTML control in there. That's right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you that, first of all, I can put this in one label like this, this item dot uh, question ID. And this is all coming from a SharePoint list. OK, so just just imagine that there's a list, all of these numbers and questions. Okay, we, all this, love- we all love SharePoint and also know that once again, like this is all being done inside of a gallery. Okay. Hmm. So what do we want to do here? Like we want to put these together in a single label to cut down on the number of controls, which is great because once a power app gets over 500 controls, sometimes performance starts to degrade. So this is a great tip for a bigger app. So what am I going to do? I'm going to delete these labels that I have right here. And I'm going to input my favorite control, the HTML text control. Very underrated. Very, very, very underrated. And now I'm going to start typing some HTML. This is where it gets a little bit, you know, beyond the the low code paradigm that uh, Power Apps is always bragging about. But you know, it's just nice to know that. If there's something kind of more custom that you need to do here, the you know there is the ability to do that. W three schools. W three schools, as a wonderful reference. Okay, so I've got my my text in here. So we're going to do a little bit of each HTML. Uh, for those who are who have never heard the term before, HTML is the language that underpins the entire internet. Every website has it. It's how you mark up the text on a page. And so we're going to apply something called the bold tag. So the letter B in between two triangle brackets. And then we're also going to put it over here as well. But we've also put this little slash before the B to say that, hey, it's uh, it's ended. So I want that to be bold. And then there you go. Now we've accomplished with in one label what we previously did in two. And there's many other things you can do. You can change the color. You can underline. You can highlight. You can italicize pretty much anything. This is actually a very important tip because I've seen galleries where we want to showcase different metadata points from our data source and we just keep adding labels in there. I think even if we don't want to utilize the formatting features of an, just like we don't want the formatting features, no problem. Still use one control and concatenate them all together. That way is you yeah. reduce the number of controls on your screen that is key in building performance apps. That's right. And also notice that I didn't use the concat function here. Just use the and sign. It's a little faster. Mm, Okay, that's a great tip. Okay, so we've got, I think we've got everything laid out, but what about those those radio buttons just have two options, but my my catch-up club needs more ratings. (laughs) (laughs) So back in SharePoint, this is actually a number field, right? So if we were trying to spawn a drop-down list or something like that, it, it wouldn't work. There's no choices 
behind it. So we can very quickly build out our list of possible answers, even though it's still number field in the background. So what do I do? I type my square brackets, right, to create a table, and then I simply type one, two, three, four, five in between the commas there. And what I've done is created a very small table, uh, a very small one column collection. And now when I click on these, I'll be able to, you know, grab that information. Hmm. Nice. So it's as easy as that. And I can. It's can as easy you, as you, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Can you show that again? Can you oh, show the item yeah, sure. property? Of, so you've had, okay. So you've basically got an array in there, one, two, three. And I'm assuming this can come from a data source as well. That can come straight from a data source as well. Yep. Nice. Hmm. Okay, I think I like I like the form now. The ordered form is looking great. I see a send to email option at the bottom. So I'm assuming we can send this as an email. But before we get there, I've noticed this a lot, is that when we use the email, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're using a text input control there. How do right. I validate whether or not the user has actually entered an email in there and not just any uh, incorrect text that does not match <laughs> the email format? Well, like as you can see right here, as a like this yeah. is not a valid email. And why is it not valid? Because it doesn't have the little at sign, right? So if I send it to somebody, it's going to go nowhere. It's going to go into the scrap bin of Power Apps emails that were never, ever sent or received. <laughs> so have you ever heard of this function called ismatch? Because ismatch is amazing. And this is like one of my favorite like hacks of all time, because what you can do is you can look at the input into a text box and see if it matches some like well-known pattern, like a phone number mm. or an email or a website or something else that has a pattern like a serial number. OK, so what I'm going to show you how to do is to make this button here become disabled if we don't have a valid email inside of it. OK, so how do we do that? Well. I'm just going to bring out a label here first to show you the result of what we're doing. So I'm going to type in the is match formula and I'm going to refer to the text box called uh, send to email. OK, and then I'm going to look at the text inside of it, right? So it's grabbing this text, which is called. Well, it should be grabbing the text inside there. Maybe it's because I haven't written the bracket yet. Oh, it's Sorry. probably not completed the formula, so it does that yeah. sometimes. And I, and I like how you just referred the control. You were not sure if it if it is the correct control, but it showcased that in a, it has like a green underline to it and it's highlighting that control in green on the screen as well. That's right. Yep. So I believe this is the correct one. And we come up with a variety of different options here. So mm. you can create your own patterns like to see if, you know, if, if it's a digit, digit, hyphen, digit, hyphen, letter, right? And kind of string them together. But PowerApps is kind of smart, so they've already wow. come up with a match email function. So if I, I click can my see the, I, I noticed the regular expression behind it when you picked match.email. IntelliSense actually showed the regular expression. Are you uh, kidding me? Is that? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You see that? Try remembering that, folks. <laughs> Not yeah. going to happen. Not going to happen. No. So, so big life hack for you there is like, Someone on the internet has always thought of something before you. Like, if you need a phone number or you know some other pattern, just search regex and uh, and 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 use it in the match function instead, right? Of trying to come up with it for yourself. But uh, how do we disable this button? Well, we go to display mode dot, and we are going to just paste in the function that we built before, and we're going to say if it's true, if it's an email, we can do display mode of the button dot edit and display mode of the button dot view. Okay. Right. Did I? Oh, no, not view, Reza. Disabled. Disabled. <laughs> I always get those. Right, it's, it's coming. It's coming up to dinner time, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we've long since passed dinner, Reza. <laughs> Why did I have to make a food based example again? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I already see it working, man. You plugged in the correct email address and, and the button just came alive. Can you can you plug in an incorrect email address again and show it? Yeah, sure. If I miss the dot here. There you go. Nice. Right. And there were plenty of formats, not just email. I noticed there was like a truckload of uh, regular expression based uh, enums already available in Power Apps that you can just plug into your apps. 
That's right. And if you go to the documentation, you can see which each one of them are in, in predefined patterns. And they've also got some um, examples for you right there as well. So very nice. Yeah. So I think it's almost done, right? We've yeah. kind of everything, but there is that send results, which I'm assuming is going to send the information of the gallery in an email to the individual's email address plugged in there. How do you do? How do you send a gallery in an email? Okay, so for the last trick of this session here, just um, somebody cross their fingers for me while I'm typing because this is a, a more hairy kind of live code example, if you will, okay? <laughs> let's let's make this work here. So what I want to do is I want to send the contents of this gallery inside an email. I want to send the question and then kind of the value beside it. And I want it to be laid out, you know, one, two, three, four, kind of stacked um, one on top of each other, okay? So what am I going to do? I'm going to create another HTML text uh, label here in my form so I can show you what I'm working on before I actually put it into the email itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is going to get a little big, so I'll just kind of leave it over here. Um, I will go to the HTML text property. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And there's this great function called concat. So what concat does is it takes a look at all of the items in a collection or a gallery, and it prints them out as a as a text string one after the other in a format that you'd find. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the information out of gallery form, and we're gonna take all the items out of it, right? So that's how you get the items out of a property in the table format. Then we are going to take the label that holds the question, to take its text so we're referring to it just like as we would normally any other place in the app and then we are going to type a little dot there next we're going to grab the label score form one oh yeah that's right because this was an html uh text i put in here i'm sorry we gotta go back here for a moment <laughs> <laughs> This is why it's tough to delete things in a presentation <laughs> as part of your presentation <laughs> rather than just create them. Okay, and then we'll type this as H HTML text. As a, what do you think is going on here? Can't I am this. getting confused. I'm assuming you're concatenating the items of the gallery and I think concat goes through each item and then you're going to you will go ahead and create this long HTML text that you're going to send out in an email. I'm assuming you're doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, oddly, the HTML property seems to be missing here. Is that kind of normal? Sorry, I just got to go back to the the magic trick there. So, is that concatenate rather than concat? Uh, possibly. So I, got I think to, that's probably because you're referencing the wrong control. So you are referencing. Let's just take it out of a uh, number one yeah. here, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, maybe that maybe that's what happened there. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to loop over that, and we're going to separate these things on different lines. So I'm using my HTML br tag, which means line break. And right. now you can see all, all right. the information from the gallery comes up in an email. Oof, I nice. think we're going to make it through this one, Reza. I really do. <laughs> yeah, we get through, actually. That's that's really neat. So I can just run concat. And I'm assuming I can run concat not just on a gallery, but anything that's a collection in Power Apps. Absolutely any collection. That's, Great. that's right. So now I'm going to go and create my email that gets generated when I hit the on select button mm -hmm. of this gallery. Mm -hmm. And as you can see here, I've kind of laid out a skeleton of what I want to what I want to do. So I'm going to say this, I'm going to set a variable called var email body, and I'm going to throw that inside of there. Mm -hmm. And I also have to send this email. So I use the Office 365 Outlook connector, which allows me to send emails from my email address. Yeah, and that's very important, from your email address. Yeah, my email address. And you have to make sure that you pick the connector beforehand or else this option won't appear. So sense. I'm going to write my own email in here, mbdevani 
gmail.com. Uh, send me all your love letters, fan letters, hate mail, anything in between. <laughs> and then uh, label. Oh, this is a text input. This is why it's so important to make sure that you're, you know, a- naming all of your inputs with a nice, uh, consistent format. So we'll call this um, audit results. And then finally, we'll put their email body. And fingers crossed that uh, email will come to me. I think we also need the text property here. Nice. There you go. Okay. So we'll send this off. Perfect. Just notice we have a quick error. I don't think that matters. Click send email. And then we'll probably just like have to wait a moment for it to come through. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Already got the audit results. Hey, and there you go. Ah. So you look, it has all the same formatting as in my um, gallery. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, and I'm assuming we can improve this further as well, right? We can add formatting to it. Oh, yeah. We can get the values of the radio button that was selected and actually send out a, uh, an, a replica of what we are looking at at the gallery in an email. 100%. I noticed like one thing I missed is also the question uh, values too. Yeah. But we could have uh, included that as Easily well, right? We could have... And not just, not just sending it in an email. Maybe we want to actually generate a file or maybe print things in my gallery, I can actually send over the HTML text over to Flow, and Flow can go ahead and generate a file for me. And then I can straight away go ahead and download that file for the user so they can print it out or maybe get a downloaded copy of the result set, what they're looking at in a gallery. That's right. That's right. We can also upload it to our data source too using Patch or or maybe Collect or something like that. Hmm. So brilliant. This looks perfect, but what's the user experience like? Awesome. Okay, so to, to wrap it up here, you guys can see I'm clicking all over the place nervously. Where's my app? Um, we're going we're gonna to play it, and we're going to see what let's, it looks like. Let's play the app. So from a browser standpoint, this is what the user experience is, right? They come in, they play the app, or normally you give them the link to the app, and they're here. Yeah. Now, everything looks good. Everything looks branded. It's really nice. I Although I love Power Apps, I don't like that purple bar on the top. It's throwing it off. It just is just throwing it off. Is there any way in which I can hide that top nav bar? There is, and it's gonna be our last Power Apps life hack of the night, sadly. So what do we do to get rid of that bar? We type and, and we type Mm -hmm. hide nav bar, hide nav bar. If we can get our spellings right, I think we'll be good. Yeah, (laughs) equals true. true. Okay, and so we can add this to the end of any link that we have made to a Power App, whether it's in an email or on your SharePoint. Mm. And when I hit enter, boom, there we go. Picture perfect. Nice. I think that Ketchup is Club is going to be so happy with our apps, right, Reza? At least I'm very happy. <laughs> and that's what's important. I really like this. I think this is really neat. I think. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of great hacks today from from galleries to tips and tricks to sending data. I think you've covered the entire length and breadth of a lot of common hacks that that folks need to be aware of, especially if you're if you're building apps day in, day out like like me and you and all of, yeah. all our all our folks on the call. So let's do like a recap. Uh, before before the recap, uh, I have a question for Matthew. Yes, sir. Uh, see, often uh, we create new, but as well we have to edit the existing uh, Power Apps. So my question is, there are uh, situations where we have to work on the galleries. So people create galleries, a vertical gallery by default. So they know they go and click it, up, click it, and they want to use that. They want to live with it. But unfortunately, I don't know whether it is a vertical gallery, what has been used, or it's a blank. Uh, fixed length gallery. So mm-hmm. how do I know what is the kind of gallery which is there on the farm uh, on the screen? Well, so Reza, do you know the answer to this one? Whether it's horizontal or vertical, that's the question, right? Yes. What type of a gallery which is already in place in the screen? Uh, trying what? to vertical gallery or fixed length gallery because today I had to change one, mm. uh, one gallery, the behavior of the gallery because if it is not in part, I don't want to, sh- uh, user don't want to see the uh, entry as part of the gallery. So 
and also with the dynamic height. So that happens only with the fix, uh, flexible, but oh, have, I don't yeah. know like, what gallery it is. Yeah. I, uh, I'm not sure of it off the top of my head, but uh, maybe we can take this one online after the presentation. If you just want to hang on the call, we could uh, talk about it for a yeah. few moments. I'm, I'm yeah. pretty, pretty much. I think I know of one, but I'm not too sure about that. Let's let's take that offline after this call. Yes, yeah, yes. yeah. I, I'm glad. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, about 30 life hacks there. Something, uh, you know, a bunch of simple tips that you can use uh, every day. I hope there was something there for everybody. I think that um, you know sometimes um, there there are things that seem like uh, tips to us or don't seem like tips to us that are tips to other people. And I've these are just kind of things that are you know what I've collected along the way in kind of my power ups journey and kind of coming along in the in the forums and stuff like that. So yeah, I think that's the that's the show, right, Reza? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. I think this was amazing we've given away you've given away a lot of really really good hacks that hopefully will help our our audience in their day-to-day -day lives with power apps so thank you so much for coming on the call and uh, three kudos to all the hard work you do on the community forums i think uh, not many people thank you enough i think i'm going to thank you today on the call i think you're doing a great job on the forums you're going all out it's not easy Thanks, i know it's not easy because i did that for three months and i lost a lot of hair <laughs> so good luck to you on that. Uh, I know it's hard to deal with questions around power apps when folks come around. I have this scenario. Can you answer this question? And they keep questioning you again and yeah, again. Yeah. So it's not it's not an easy thing being on the forums. But for folks who are not on the forums, I highly recommend you to check out the community forums. Start helping start helping people out. I've noticed Krishna now is active on the forum. So uh, yes. please, guys, come into the community forums and. Uh, Thank you, Matt. Once again, uh, I I really liked your presentation today. I think this was one of one of the best presentations of our user group to date. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. I think we had our highest audience count ever for yeah. the user, user group today. I think we beat forty at one time. I'm sorry, I had to move to my mobile device because my uh, network started dropping. But uh, I think I did a good job by playing dumb, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think could, if I could just say uh, one more thing, um, I've just put my slide up on the screen here again. Um, seriously, guys, uh, just reach out to me on Twitter. Like if you want to say hello, I'm talking to maybe two or three people, uh, you know, in the PowerPoints community, just kind of each weekend, just kind of chit chat and like doing Teams calls and stuff like that. Or if you just have a specific question, just drop me a line because yep. you're all part of the user group here. And like, really, I'd love to talk to you. Like, you even, like the, even if you don't want to say hello to Matt. Trust me, he puts out a lot of hacks on Twitter as well. So you'll get a lot of hacks to look at on Twitter that, that he puts out every now and then. So please do follow him on uh, on Twitter. And I'm sure once you head over to the community forum, his name will be right on top. So you don't have to follow him there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And if you want to chat after the call, just stay on the call for a little bit and uh, yep. I'll answer some more questions. I and Matt will hang on to the call. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We will meet again next uh, month on the third Wednesday. I believe it is June the 17th. Get connected to the user group. And thank you, thank you once again. I will go ahead and stop the recording for today's conversation.